Hello everyone, welcome back to our uh, Sabbath School uh, presentation for uh, uh, series number 5, uh, October 30, uh, fourth quarter 2021. And so uh, this morning, uh, we are going to deal with the stranger in your gates, uh, in the idea of, uh, if you notice here, last week we talked about, uh, you know, the... Uh, the idea of uh, Leviticus, uh, love, your na- uh, love your God supremely. And uh, I mean in Deuteronomy, and love your God supremely and uh, with all your heart. Now, of course, uh, this is, uh, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, s- typical aspects of, again of uh, the book of Deuteronomy. But before we begin our discussion, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, dear God, uh, thank you for uh, making us, uh, uh, you know, your, your people, giving us the opportunity to uh, deal with uh, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the historical uh, lessons in the past, and yet it has some, uh, you know, implications in our current uh, situation. Today, Lord, we ask uh, your guidance as uh, we deal with details uh, in the subject about the strangers in your gates. May it be, Lord, that as uh, we look into this subject, that you open our hearts and our minds, that we may be able to uh, understand uh, your will, uh, as you have said in your, to your people in the past and also to us in the church. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so the strangers in your gates is uh, a subject for today, and uh, uh, mind you here, uh, uh, let's look at the, uh, the lesson uh, outline here. Uh, introduction, and then we are going to deal with circumcise your hearts. Love the stranger, for you were strangers in Egypt. Judge righteously a pure religion before God, and then the summary. Uh, so, uh, Jesus, uh, remember last week we delivered about this uh, subject also in Mark 12, verse 30. Jesus was asked the most important commandment of the law. He answered, love the Lord your God. And mentioned a second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. So uh, in this case, uh, we can see uh, that in Deuteronomy, addresses the love for your neighbor, indeed, especially the strangers. And uh, fatherless, the widows, and are often mentioned too. And uh, so uh, in here we can go to deal with uh, what do we do? What do we need to love the stranger? And then, of course, why should we love the stranger? And because God loves them, because we are strangers too, uh, uh, referring to the, uh, remember, uh, the, the Israelites were strangers in Egypt. They, were beca- they became slaves. And for 400 years, uh, they were there as strangers in the, land of, uh, in, in the country of Egypt. And uh, they don't belong there. So uh, this would be, and then how should we treat the strangers? Treating them fairly and caring for them. So these are the subjects that we are going to... Uh, deal with uh, as uh, we continue on with our discussion. Our key text here is that, therefore, love the strangers, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. This is uh, uh, most, most likely today. We are going to deal in chapter 10 of the book of Deuteronomy. And this text here is part of uh, the Ten Commandments uh, that uh, God gave uh, during the time of Moses. Uh, here, he repeated it again uh, when, before they went into the land of Canaan and says, therefore, love the strangers for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So, uh, <clears throat> this, this series of studies in Deuteronomy does not take a chapter-by-chapter chapter approach again to the book. Instead, it takes a thematic approach treating a number of different themes in the book. And the theme for this week's study is the stranger. In the narrower sense, the stranger represents the foreigner or the refugee. In the broadest 
sense, the stranger is anyone who is different from the community norm. How does the theme relate to the theme of love in the previous week's lesson? So that is the question that we need to deal with today. And so uh, in, we are going to read uh, our Sunday's lesson, Circumcise Your Heart. It says, Deuteronomy chapter 10, 1 to 11. What is the purpose of this review of the previous generation's history? Why is the story of Moses and the tables of stone retold here? What is the significance of God's, God choosing the tribe of Levi to perform the services at the tabernacle? And then we continue on in verse 12 to 13. It says that uh, uh, from the previous week's lesson, what does God want from his people? And 14 to 16 uh, what is the meaning of the images used in this passage? What does the depth of God's forgiveness here tell us about this grace? So that is, uh, uh, let's read the text in Deuteronomy uh, 10, 1 to, 1 to uh, 11. And I'm showing here the first five verse, verses. At the time the Lord said to, to me, Chisel out the two stones, tablets like the first ones, and came up to me on the mountain, also make a wooden ark. Now, remember that uh, when Moses, uh, uh, the first time when Moses was asked by God to go up the mountain, Mount Sinai, and Mount Horeb, the same thing. And then when he went down, uh, uh, you know, the Israelites, uh, you know, worshipping uh, the idols, the golden, uh, the golden cow that was and they were requesting Aaron and Miriam to do. And then Moses was so mad, and so Moses broke, you know, because of his anger, uh, he broke the t- tablets of stone that God told him, the Ten Commandments. It was written in... in this. So God again here, at the time the Lord said to me, chisel out of two stone tablets like the first ones. The first ones came up to me, and I will write on the tablets... The words that were on the first tables, which you broke, then you were to put them in the ark. So I made the ark out of acacia wood, chiseled out, uh, you know, uh, out two stone tablet like the first ones, and went up on the mountain with the two tablets in my hand. And then the Lord, and remember this, the Lord wrote on these tablets what he had written before, the Ten Commandments. He had proclaimed to you on the mountain, out of the fire on the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them to me. And when I came back down the mountain and put the tablets to the ark I had made, as the Lord commanded me, they, were, uh, they are there now. And in verse 6, And the Israelites traveled from the wells of Beni Jakha to Mosira. There Aaron died and was buried, and Eliezer, his son, succeeded him as priests. And from there, they traveled to Gul- uh, Golgoda and on to Jatuba, a land with stream of water. At the time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister and pronounce a blessing in His name, as they still do today. That is why the Levites have no share in the inheritance among their fellow Israelites, the Lord is their inheritance, as the Lord your God told them. Now I had stayed in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights, as I did the first time, and the Lord listened to me at the time. At this time also, it was not His will to destroy you. Go, the Lord said to me, and lead the people on their way, so that they may enter and possess the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. So here, if you notice... uh, uh, remember, uh, the tribe of Levi and Simeon was a notorious Levite. Remember, uh, you know, they, ca- they killed uh, an, their neighbor. And here God, uh, because of his grace, allotted a very special, uh, uh, you know, uh, special uh, work for the Levites. And they have no inheritance. And that's how God, gra- as gracious God is. And so, in, in essence, really, God... Uh, in, in his goodness and in his kindness, in spite of what they did before, still was able to uh, 
to be, you know, that the Levites was carry ark of the covenant of the Lord to stand before the Lord to minister and pronounce the blessing in His name. So, uh, in this case, and then we go on here in twelve thirteen. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. We discussed about this last week. And observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. And then verse 14, To the Lord your God belong to the heavens and the highest of heavens, earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them and he chose you, the descendants above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your heart, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked like any longer. So this is the, uh, the, the uh, text that we are going to deal with today. Uh, so uh, what do we need to love the strangers? Why do we need? What do we need to love the strangers? And says, uh, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be, st- uh, and, and be stiff neck no longer. See, uh, in, 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 I, I thought that it was only Paul that mentioned this in the New Testament, but it's already there, uh, you know, the, the, the foreskin of your heart. It's dealing with a very important uh, aspects of uh, uh, images in here. The Israelites will already, uh, you know, the, the Israelites were already transgressing the law by making a golden idol while God was writing it on the stone tablets. They broke the command, the covenant that they, they made with God. And so here, we can see Moses broke uh, the tablets God had written because the people had broken covenant. However, God forgave them and ordered Moses to prepare a new tablets, giving him a new chance in Deuteronomy uh, 10, 1 and 2. And so nevertheless, they couldn't be faithful to the covenant if they only trusted external signs like physical circumcisions. And so therefore, the text in 10, 16 says, you know, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. It's dealing with uh, not, not external signs, but, you know, uh, the, 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 the heart deals with uh, full, you know, uh, concept of you being there. And so uh, the needed circumcisions of the heart, and only then they could love the stranger. So in essence, really, uh, it begins with me. Love the strangers couldn't be, couldn't happen until I, I, you know, I have, I have a changed heart. Transformation is very important in essence, really. So the story of God rewriting His law uh, on the new tablets is a story of God's grace and patient love for Israel. In ancient times, when a covenant was broken, the renewal. Uh, <coughs> Of new treaty documents, it is, has, is prepared. It is against the backdrop of a shameful event at Horeb that Moses urges Israel to renew its covenant and to prepare a new oath of allegiance in which God's requirements for his people is specified. These verses bring together various themes around the people of love, namely love for the Lord, the first commandments, and love for love as a response to God's love and forgiveness, love for one's neighbor, and more specifically for the stranger, the second commandment, because God loved him or her. The fact that God told Moses to who a new tablet like the first, and he would write them on the words that were on the first shows that God had forgiven the people, and was not done with them even then. So God's demand to Israel to circumcise their heart is, of course, not to be taken literally. Moses' reference to this uncircumcision of the lips in Exodus 6, 12, and 30 suggests that his lips are closed and he cannot speak fluently. And Jeremiah deplores that Israel has uncircumcised ears meaning that they cannot hear the word of the Lord. 
Because circumcision is a sign of the covenant in Genesis 17. And the circumcision of the heart is an image that symbolizes the inner circumcision that Paul will describe later in the, con- in the conversion of the Christian in Romans chapter 2. This is a procedure that only God can perform. Before entering the country of Canaan, the men of Israel will have to be circumcised as a sign of the covenant. The circumcision of the heart concerns those who already are circumcised of the flesh. And the renewal of the covenant is not new. Circumcision that would annul the preceding, the, <laughs> the preceding one. But deepening of the same covenant and its laws. After having received the letter of the law, they are now called to root their commitment in their heart. This entails not just refraining from doing wrong, but more important, not desiring to do wrong. Not just refraining from doing wrong, but engaging one's whole life in doing good. Only love will make this commitment possible. This is why God's requirement at this stage is a covenant based on love and is therefore more demanding and more thorough. And in order to live an unselfish, God-centered, neighbor-centered life, we need to let God transform us. In the words of Moses, circumcise your heart in uh, Deuteronomy 10, 16, and this command is uttered in the sitting of Israel's stubbornness. And do not be stiff any longer. It is not enough to be outwardly circumcised. What is needed is a new heart. And this, is, and this transformation cannot be achieved by human effort. So that is uh, how we are, you know, uh, need the strangers uh, in, in Armandes' lesson. Love the stranger. Deuteronomy 10, 17 to 19. Why does God use the language like God of gods here? Why does the analogy of taking bribes came up here? Why is the connection between the earlier parts of this chapter and the command of God gave to Israel here? How does Psalms 146, 5 to 10 further analyze the concept? And so... Uh, Let's look at the text in Deuteronomy 10, 17 to 9. It says, uh, For the Lord your God is a God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great God, a mighty and awesome God, who shows no partiality and can accept no bride. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and, the love, and loves the foreigner residing among you giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Now let's go back to verse 17. It says that, For the Lord your God is God of gods, and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty, awesome, who shows no personality. In essence, really, we we need to understand that Israel now is being reminded because of the neighboring countries have their many gods, you know. But Israel is reminded that there is only one God, and that is God. The great God, almighty and awesome. Uh, in essence, really, it, the, 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 the other gods that the, the other nations or and the neighboring uh, uh, people uh, uh, cannot compete with the God of the Israel. Because he is the God that creates mighty and awesome and so no partiality and accepts. And yet, in spite of his mightiness and awesomeness, he shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Accepts no bribe. Because in the culture during a time, their gods can be bribed, you know. You offer the, uh, you know, offerings, uh, uh, you know, in, in essence really is that they are only appeased by some offering. That is a bribery. But in God, the God of Israel cannot be bribed. 
accepts no bribe. That means to say that uh, uh, in fairness to anybody, uh, you know, he, can, he, he, he is not partial. And he defends the cause of fatherless. So this text, in essence, make us uh, realize that the, and let's look at Psalms here, 146 to 5 and 10, verses 5 and 10. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord of God, their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea, everything in them. He remains faithful forever. See, that this is really what makes sense when in, in verse 17 here of says, God of gods, great God, mighty and awesome. So, and, and further in, in essence in book of Psalms, David, the author of Psalms here, he is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and the everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. And the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, and the Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. And the Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations, praise the Lord. So, in this context, we can see that Moses really makes it very, very clear to Israel that God is the God, the only God that can help, and God loves the strangers. See, in, in this case, uh, in this case, we can see <coughs> we can see the, the beauty of God's love, the stranger. He administers justice to the fatherless and the widow, loves a stranger, giving them food and clothing. Uh, Deuteronomy 10, 18. So, uh, in the idea of, in, 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 we can enumerate the reason why we should love the stranger. Moses enumerates them in these two verses. He says, because God is God of gods and Lord of lords. And because he is great, mighty, and awesome. And because he is not biased and does not accept bribes. And because he defends the fatherless and the widow. And because he loves a stranger, giving him food and clothing. And God is almighty. He does not need anything and can do anything he wants. Still, he loves a stranger and helps them. He also invites us to love them and help them. That's the only reason that we need to love the strangers in our gates. So, uh, in our Tuesday's lesson, and Deuteronomy 10, 9, alongside with 15, uh, Genesis 15, 13, look up the meaning of a stranger in Hebrew uh, in uh, the original language, ger. And what is the concept of stranger? Means to Israel in Egypt. Who is the stranger in our Southern California today, wherever you live? What does Matthew seven twelve add to this concept? So, for you were strangers in Egypt. Let's read the text here. And Deuteronomy 10, 19, And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. And in Genesis 15, 13, then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that 400 years your descendants will be strangers in the country, not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. And so uh, God already knew. Uh, he was telling Abraham in chapter 15 of Genesis that his descendants will be, be strangers in the land of Egypt, and, and, you know, and, and, and they will be enslaved and mistreated, and God knew. And so, uh, God knew for certain, that 400 years, 400 years, that's a long years. And so, in Matthew, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and, and the prophets. So, uh, in essence, really, we are strangers too. Uh, 
Therefore, love the strangers for you are strangers. We are strangers. The people of Israel were enslaved, you know, in Egypt. It was foretold by Abraham, uh, to Abraham. They experienced what it's like to be a stranger and marginalized firsthand. And God encouraged uh, them to remember their own experience and to treat the strangers and the marginalized as the full citizen. The laws should be the same for natives and foreigners. Wow. And so we are also, because we are also slaves. We have been enslaved by sin. And we are strangers on this earth. We must be a light that shows love of God through the way we lovingly treat others. We must treat others as we want, we want to be treated in Matthew 7, 12. So uh, the Israelites were admonished to be kind to immigrants and remember that they had been foreigners in Egypt. It was not a time for revenge, but for compassion and kindness. Their acts of mercy will demonstrate their appreciation for God's merciful work in their behalf. Since they were uh, now free in their prosperity, they should always think about others in need and helping them in the meaningful ways. God advised the Israelites not to treat strangers as they have been treated in Egypt. They needed to esteem everyone and grant them respect. Foreigners or strangers were to have the right to prosperous <coughs> lives. And being strangers in Egypt, they knew bitterness and humiliations. And of that experience, they were to treat foreigners with compassion, dignity, care, and love. No one was to be mistreated, starved, or made poor. Strangers were to be included in the experience of the Sabbath rests. So, because remember, remember, uh, you know, the seventh day Sabbath, it says, you, you should not do anything, including the strangers, including your servants, including all that is in your gates. And so, uh, God, in your uh, association, in your association with others, put yourself in their place. Enter in their, into their feelings, their difficulties, their disappointment, their joys, and their sorrows. Identify yourself with them, and then do them as were you to exchange places with them. You would wish them to deal with you. This is the true rule of honesty. And so uh, today, uh, Mount, uh, thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, uh, chapter 6, page, uh, you know, page 134. So on a Wednesday's lesson, Wednesday's lesson, uh, we can read uh, Deuteronomy 1, 16, 16, 19, 24, 17, and 27, 19. What is the common theme in this text? What kind of behavior should the people of God exhibit when they come into power? Who are the oppressors of the poor in our own context today? So, uh, let's read the text here. Uh, Deuteronomy 1.16 And I charge you, your judges at the time, hear the disputes between your people and judge fairly. Whether the case is between two Israelites or between an Israelite and a foreigner residing among you. In 16 verse 19, it says, Do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the innocent. In 24 verse 17, Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice, or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. And then in 27, 19, it says, Cursed is anyone who withholds justice from the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Now, what is the common, the common uh, thread, uh, common uh, you know, theme in this text? And what kind of behavior should the people of God 
exhibit. And so, uh, here in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, in essence, Moses was instructing the Israelites to be fair, to be just, because we need, uh, you know, just righteously. In essence, really, that uh, we are to be what is this? What is this? Uh, uh, it says that to the seven nineteen cursed is anyone who withholds justice. Justice is in in the original context in Hebrew is protecting. Justice is not only about dispensing uh, what the law says, but protecting, protecting the the, the you know the helpless, protecting uh, those people who are. Uh, you know, uh, not able to protect themselves. And it's being defined here as the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. And so Jesus Christ focused on this one too when we go to the New Testament. He. So, in essence, treating the, strange, the stranger fairly is very important. Uh, then I command you, judge at the time, saying, hear the cases uh, between your brethren and judge righteously between a man of his, and his brother or the stranger who is with him. So here God wants everyone to be treated fairly, no matter their social position. Stranger or native, poor or rich. And so uh, this is really very practical in a sense. If it was applicable during the time of Israel in the olden history. This is so much needed in our time today. Very relevant. God wants everyone to be treated fairly, no matter their social standing position. And God, he, these are the rules based on, uh, based on God's own nature. He is fair and does not accept bribes. The messages of the prophets are full of reprimands excuse me, for subjecting the defenseless to the poor treatment. In essence, this is a reflection of who God is. And he wants his people to follow him, to Im- imitate his own ways of dealing with the needy and, and the helpless. And so uh, we may not have legal authority to change the laws of our country or how, we are apply, uh, how they are applied. However, we can treat everyone we met the same way regardless of the condition. Wow. So uh, this lesson really is the principle of social justice demands that we value each other highly because we are, called, we are created by God in his image. There is no exception. Even though sin has marred this image, in a dramatic way, we should treat each other with respect because the one who diminishes God's creation disrespect also God, the creator. So uh, the idea of uh, stranger fa- uh, treating the stranger fairly is not new. It was when Jesus Christ came here on earth, he did the same. So the principles of God's character and his treatment of the needy and the poor and the helpless is his reflection of who he is. Uh, that's why treating the stranger fairly is very important for us because if we are God's follower, we should follow the way he treats others. And so uh, in pure religion, uh, Thursday's lesson, pure religion, this passage in Deuteronomy 24, 10 to 15, this passage gives us keen insight into everyday life in ancient Israel. How do these this laws impact the topic of how to treat the stranger within Israel? And then James uh, 1, 27 uh, to chapter 2, verse 11, how does the New Testament apply the principles of Deuteronomy to church life how does James link this principle to the Ten Commandments? What implications does this have on our view of the Ten Commandments? 
Why do you think James leaves out the further in this application a non-partiality of Deuteronomy? Can one be faithful to the Ten Commandments without taking James and Deuteronomy seriously? So let's read the text. Deuteronomy 24, 10 to 15, it says that when you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, do not go into their house to get what is offered to you as a pledge. Stay outside and let the neighbor to whom you are making the loan bring the pledge out to you. If the neighbor is poor, do not go to sleep with their pledge in your positions. Return their clock by sunset so that your neighbor may sleep in it. Then they will thank you and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord your God. Do not take advantage of hired workers who is poor and needy, whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your own towns. Pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and are counting on it. Otherwise, they may cry to the Lord against you and they will be guilty, and you will be guilty of sin. Wow, this is serious. And so uh, uh, I think we need to deal with uh, here and clarify this, how James understood the book of Moses, uh, writing of Moses in chapter 24. Let's look, let's look at James. Uh, James uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 27, and Matthew uh, chapter 2, uh, 1 to 11. It says here, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. My, brother, my brothers and sisters, now James now is talking to the church in the New Testament. He, is, he was the, the, the president of the church during this time. And he was addressing the church exactly. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man and a filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here is a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who are exploiting you. Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law of lawless lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not commit murder, but if you do not commit adultery, do not commit murder, you have become a law, uh, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. So uh, the question is, what does, what does James think about this? Uh, uh, you know, Deuteronomy chapter 24. Don't show favoritism. The same thing. The application may be, you know, if you notice here, James did not mention about the strangers. But he is dealing with, with the church now that is a mixture of everybody, you know, Jewish and, 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 and Gentiles that were converted into the church. And so 
here he is addressing now the whole body of the church. And so uh, caring for the strangers is very important. You shall not oppress or hide servant who is poor and needy, whether or your brethren or one of the aliens who is in your land within your gates. You shall not oppress them. And so paying the wages of workers promptly, returning the clothes borrowed from the poor, not going into someone's house to collect a debt. These are ways to show respect and care for those in need of the stranger. And of course, James wrote about the same respect and care of those in need within the church, rejecting privileges of the rich which are determined, uh, de determined to the poor. And so, James considered partiality a transgression of the Ten Commandments. Pure religion involves caring for others. So, Christ in Ellen White Hall here in, in the Ministry of Healing. Next uh, slide here. Christ recognized no distinction of nationality or rank or creed. The scribes and Pharisees desired to make local and a national benefit of the gift of heaven and to exclude the rest of God's family in the world. But Christ came to break down every wall of partitions. He came to show that his gift of mercy and love is unconfined as the air, the light, or the showers of rain that traverses the earth. Because in God's blessing and economy, the rain you know, showers everybody, whether you are a Christian or non-Christians, whether you are a Muslim or or, you know, uh, an atheist. It, it blesses everybody. And yet, uh, we need to understand that uh, uh, in, in all this intricate idea of the Ten Commandments, loving God and loving your, your, in, you know, your neighbors as yourselves, is very important because that's a fulfillment of God's law. When we do that, Jesus said that... Uh, uh, one of the days, uh, Jesus said, uh, has mentioned uh, in, in the book of Matthew, told the story about, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, the sheep and the goat. And when the separation comes, and he said, uh, he is going to say that those who loved and visited me, those who fed me when I was hungry, and those, uh, you know, uh, uh, took care of the sick, and those people are, and then we ask a question, when did we do that, Lord? And then, and, and, and then Jesus said, if you have done this to the list, you have done it to me. You know, this is very important because in, in, in God's, uh, when, when God chose Israel to be a, bless, you know, a vehicle of blessings to other nations, he chose it and he blessed them materially. God blessed, uh, you know, the Israelites with all the, 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 the things that they needed. He blessed them with riches. He blessed them with all the health and they need because of the principles of, uh, you know, good eating and stuff like that. The principles of, you know, clean and unclean food. The principles of loving uh, your neighbor as yourselves. Very important and essentially because... When you follow God's uh, intention of the Ten Commandments, it is really a blessing to the community. It is a blessing because it is God's principle. It is a reflection of who He is. And that's why very important for us to realize that this is, uh, 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 an essence, the blessings that talk about the strangers in your gate. Now, we are going to summarize our discussion this morning. And so, uh, 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 the stranger in your gates, it says here that uh, God wants our hearts, that is our minds, our affections, our love. When he said, uh, you need to be uh, circumcised in your heart. He wants our hearts. He wants our minds, our affections, our love. Uh, because when we do that, then... Uh, 
we can uh, we can do the 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 God who takes note if a sparrow falls on the ground knows the plight of those who are in the mar- uh, or the margins of the society because if we love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our minds and with all our soul uh, the only outcome that we do is that we can also uh, you know, take care of the marginalized in our society. Uh, this is the outcome rather than, you know, doing and struggling, struggle, struggle to do it. It is just a natural, natural uh, flow of reactions if we do that. And so, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and of the prophets. Matthew seven twelve. This is what Jesus told uh, you know, the, the, uh, the lawyer, in the discussion, when the lawyer asked him what is, you know, uh, the, the best commandments, the law, that, uh, the number one in the law. He included also the sums up the law of the prophets. You shall be holy, for I am the Lord your God. I'm holy. And this is very essence that uh, in choosing Israel, to be a separated nation in order to be a blessing to other nations. Uh, this should uh, reflect God's holiness in order for them to be able to be blessings around the community. To be holy is, is an influence that God uh, applies into our lives. And so loving our neighbor as yourself is the highest expression of God's law. Really. In essence, and this is the last slide's that we have here, because in essence, uh, expression of God's law is that uh, <coughs> the idea of the Ten Commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, and the second expression is to love your neighbor as yourself. So that is our lesson for today, and I hope that you, you think about this, loving the strangers, is that the question is, who is the strangers in our community today? Who would be in our family? Who would be in a church that they may be able to think about? Think about it. Because you know, there are people who are in need in there. And so I think we need to, to think about this. Uh, let's close with a prayer. The Lord, thank you so much for uh, this lesson. Uh, giving us an insight of your instruction to your people in the past, and yet it has some relevance in our time today, especially in our church. May it be, Lord, that as uh, we think about this, that you give us that incentive, that motivation, and that commitment that we will do it because you have loved us also as a stranger. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.